When you think about digital adoption, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Um, bullshit bingo. Welcome back to the Digital Adoption Show. Um, I'm your host, Gokul Suresh, Head of Growth and Field Marketing at WhatFix. And I have a really interesting personality with me today and uh, with a really interesting topic as well. Right? Allow me to welcome Peter Reba, Head of Digital Learning and Analytics at uh, Novo Nordisk from the beautiful and amazing Copenhagen. And I'm really excited for this episode. And more than the excitement, it's an absolute uh, fascination Right, and on, on this podcast, um, we're going to be talking about all things learning analytics. Thanks, Google. I'm so happy to be here. I mean, I also find this super fascinating so that other people, you know, wants to go into depth and really nerd this through with me is just an amazing thing. So, uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome, man. You know, uh, I just realized that I spoke a lot about the topic, but less about you. <laughs> So <laughs> it would be um, awesome if you could introduce yourself uh, to the audience and um, explain what you do at Noah Nordisk currently and um, how your journey has been with l and Yeah, I'm from Denmark. I've been working in l and for the past, I don't know, 10, 15 years, both in the public sector where I started out as a teacher, building digital learning platforms, going into corporate, working in, in the wind industry with Siemens Gamesa, and then moved on to virtual reality stuff uh, for a short while, and then into Novo Nordisk, where I hit up uh, the digital learning space globally, but also learning analytics. So it's been a journey from producing e-learning to now trying to figure out how does our learning interventions, both digital and analog, face-to-face, -face, how do they create impact, if any, in the organization? How do we prove that? Because that's, that's kind of the journey that it's become. And it's much more fascinating than, than producing content, I think. So, yeah. Let's, let's set context for the audience as well. In fact, this is the first episode we have on the Digital Option Show about learning analytics. So I want to make it very clear to the audience, what is it all about, right? And how do you, how do you really define it? And what, what do you call learning analytics? And why do you need to evangelize it, right? Especially in the <laughs> L&D and the HR community, right? So Peter, uh, if you could explain more on that. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll be happy to. Learning analytics is in, in the context that I'm in is super, super simple. You've got some completion data on what people are learning and you know training, what activities are people doing? And this is in, mostly in the formal space, but you can also collect data on the informal stuff, which is a little bit more fluffy because it's not really learning activities, but it's definitely things people do in the context of learning. So, but what you do is you collect data on people's uh, training and learning behavior, and it's probably going to come from your learning management system or your learning experience platform or whatever systems you have in place to collect uh, activity from what people are doing. That's a kind of a baseline. We, we need to do that. Most systems can do that. But that's only going to be vanity metrics if that stands alone, because then we can report on how many people went through how many courses and spent how many hours on all these things, and it doesn't really say anything. So the magic comes, it's not magic, it's not really magic, but I think it's, it's kind of magical what happens when you do that, uh -huh. uh, do it, is that when you connect that data with your people data, so data about where people are located, how old they are, what genders they are, what personality profiles they have, all sorts of people data, salary levels, all sorts, obviously completely anonymized. I have to say that we really need to protect people's data, but we do have that option often in, in HR or people uh, development to get a hold of that data from our peers in, in, in the places working with that kind of data. Um, and then... Once we are outside HR, which is probably the most important thing, we'll need to go out and collect data on sales performance, on safety, on um, production efficiency, on deviances in production, all sorts of business KPIs or indicators telling us what performance is in the mm -hmm. context of where people work. Because mm -hmm. when we correlate those two things, when we, when we put them together, we will be able to say, if there's a correlation, and we have to make sure that we separate correlation from causation, mm. which means we cannot say that because people did this training, they did this. That is causation. There are so many other variables in, in this um, equation. So people are irrational creatures, right? <laughs> they do things in different contexts with different people and different timings. So we can't say that this training was the only reason why people 
did this better or worse or whatever we would like to see. So it's a correlation. But the more that you test that, the more you test, you put your trainings in a context or learning activities in a context where you can say, did this happen? Yes, that happened. Okay, let's try again with this audience. Did the same thing happen or, or did something else happen? All right, the same thing happened. We'll retry that in a context, maybe even do some A-B testing. That's something that we can come, we can talk about a little bit later, I guess, when we talk a little bit more about learning um, in, in general, learning design stuff. But maybe do some testing on different versions of your course or your program or whatever the, the learning activity that you're doing. And then you'd be able to strengthen your correlations towards causation. Maybe at some point you read uh, some version of causality if you do. So experimenting, do controlled experimenting, and then testing your content in a, in, in a, you know, a context. And then you'll be able to see, are your training and learning activities contributing to the things that they're supposed to contribute to? The sales training that you guys are doing, is that actually for the people who's on the sales training courses, mm -hmm. improving sales, if that's the target. It's, it usually is, right? Or creating better conversations or whatever. So you've got safety training. The safety training that you guys push out into the organization for a lot of people, is that actually improving safety for these people? Can we measure an outcome of um, the training that people have been on or the correlation between those two? That's pretty simple. Yes. So, but the thing, the magic source here, uh, Google, is to ask the question before you even design and distribute learning, what's going to change in the business or with people on the other side of people having been through this learning intervention? What's the indicator that's supposed to change? Mm -hmm. Is it a sales increase? Is it a cost reduction? Is it a safety improvement? Is what, is, what do you expect is going to happen for the audience, with the audience, on the other side of you having trained people. Mm. Yeah. Very few people get around to answer, asking that question before they do anything. Because we're experienced people, we know that this solution is the best one and our design will work. But actually, we don't really know. And if we don't test with different versions, how would we know if it's our version that works the best or would there be other you know, pivots that would be more efficient in the same context? We don't know if we don't try it. This is how you do, you know, this is how science work. You test different versions of the same thing. They do it in product marketing. You know, when people need to launch or companies need to launch new products with their marketing stuff, they test and they do all sorts of testing with, with audiences. What works best, what lands best with this group, do analysis, go back, change a few things, go back, do the testing again. And well, I can't see why we're not doing that in learning development. And we've got all the data available to, to make, that, uh, make that analysis. So for me, Learning analytics is to prove a correlation between the training effort that you're doing and the outcome that you want. That was a long speech. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure, Peter, if someone actually paid attention and listened to that, they would be so inspired to actually <laughs> take up learning analytics. Um, in, in fact, a few things really strike me, right? Uh, you know, how the whole idea is very much relevant to a marketer or a thing that a marketer does. I mean, I'm a marketer and, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, we depend on data heavily to make sense of what we're doing, right? And uh, that's the only way we see that we can grow ultimately, right? Even with this podcast, I mean, unless we are measuring the data on how the traffic is coming in, how, how many listeners do we have, we won't know how do we grow there. And often in my interaction with um, L&D professionals, particularly, I mean, we've been doing a lot of events, a lot of activities, podcasts, all of that, right? And we see that people create, we focus a lot on the creation aspect and they do amazing stuff with it. But does it see till the end? I mean, is it causing that yeah. impact that it was originally intended to? I mean, is that magic really happening, <laughs> right? So... I think, yeah, that's what, I mean, you guys are the magician. I mean, anybody who knows learning analytics should be the magician who can actually show that, oh, okay, this is how it's happening, <laughs> right? Maybe revealing the magic, but still, it's, it's still uh, very important, right? Yeah, perfect. I think that, that helps a lot in setting the context. And in fact, one thing you mentioned again, you know, it helps. Can L&D practitioners make decisions that impact the business, right? That is what it helps in, right? So... Again, to get to that point, how do you how do you get there? Simply put, right? What is a framework that you should be creating to create an effective learning analytics strategy? Yeah, that's a really good question. 
Well, you need to prioritize it. And as you say, creation is often the forefront. That's what we're thinking about, making cool stuff for people. And, and the strategy is that we don't know whether that really cool stuff will end well. So that's a brilliant point, Gokul. I agree with that. The framework is, yeah, it's pretty simple. You need a data lake, right? You need some somewhere where you can put your data and where you can pull in data from other places to your pond, to your data lake. Mm -hmm. And that means that you need the learning data that you have, the training um, activities data on that. You need people data. You need behavioral data if you can get it. So how are people interacting with the other systems in your in your company, like on Teams, on Yammer, if the Microsoft suite is what you're using? How are people accessing what? What are people searching for on SharePoint? What are people interested in? So you can do text analysis on trends, trending stuff on Yammer, and you can do all sorts of things that doesn't violate privacy, but is, is kind of an analysis of what's going on. Now, Laurie Niles Hoffman is one of the people I will mention that you guys should follow. She's doing some of that um, work around data-informed, uh, um, data-driven learning design, mm -hmm. where you can where you can actually get insights from these sources to create your training, which is a is, is a different turnaround, and we are also doing that. So, but your framework should be around get the data structure in place, know what kind of data you'd want. Um, from the business is really important mm -hmm. from your own HR on people so we know who people are and we can start discriminating say we know that women uh, between 25 and 40 primarily access these things at these times they are working in this business unit where the strategy is this would it make sense to because we can see in the performance metrics that sales are not really picking up in this area and this this audience that we just mentioned are some of those who should drive it should we try and place a training in this context to see if that affects the, the sales? And, and that's the, those are some of the hypotheses that you should mm -hmm. make. You need that foundational piece where you've stitched the data together. So get the foundation right. Get someone in who knows how to structure data from mm -hmm. sources, how to make a data lake, how to set up APIs if you can, access point interfaces that transfers the data automatically, runs the data automatically into your uh, lake, mm -hmm. and then, then get that structure set so you can start doing your hypothesis work from there. So then you have the foundation. You've got the insights. Right now, I think still the dialogue, and has been for a while in l and is that we don't want to be order takers. We don't want the business to come ask us for stuff. We'd actually like to go proactively and say, guys, we can see that in your region, sales is dropping. We can also see that the audience who's been taking this training has actually performed better than the other audiences. Would it make sense that we distribute the same training to this audience and see how it works and maybe do an A-B test between these, you know, and stuff like that. It's, that's the conversation you can start having. That's really difficult to do in real life because <laughs> stakeholders, customers in, in the business or inside your company they won't be asking you for these things. Yeah. Now, they'll want it if you put it in front of them and say, guys, this is actually what we can do. But they're so used to coming to you and say, we need a training on leadership. Mm. <laughs> and we'd be asking, why? Because it's important. It's in our strategy. And you're like, yeah, but do, do you actually have a problem with leadership? And where's the, where's the you know? And, and then you can have a conversation around that, but it'll be around gut feelings. But if you have the data set up to say something smart about how leadership is running through, uh, let's say, it's people surveys, People give feedback on their managers and people surveys, right? You can access the data on an anonymized basis, but still identify areas where things are traveling better than others. And then you can tell them, we know that it's, yeah, it's rating, rating pretty low in, in, in your part of the business. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Can we see any patterns in training and learning that could help it already with the stuff that we historically know? Or do we need to design something that should change the rating from X to Y? And then we'll start working from there that uh, offset is much, much better than yeah. just the gut feelings around we need a leadership course. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a very scalable process. I mean, once you set it up, no matter how large your organization is or you know how many business units you have, I mean, that's something which you can plug and play once you set it up, right? Yeah. And no more spray and pray, right? <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> I love that term. Yes, no more spray and pray. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. And uh, so I understand that, you know, there would be some kind of, you know, 
tech aspects that is also involved in this, right? So to set it up at least for L&D folks who are not completely tech savvy, but you know, who are much focused on creating. Now, who would be the stakeholders in rolling out such a project, right? I mean, who would help with the you know tech aspects of it? Who would be owning this or you know, who would, the, who would be the decision makers there? Uh, I'm, I'm just trying to break it down for the audience who would want to actually get to a point they start learning analytics actively uh, in the organization. Yeah, well, I'm not going to fool anyone. It, it's really easy to do if you have the people that think it's really easy to do and know how to do it, right? But that's that's the magic. If you have no idea, you probably need to hire someone who knows how to structure data and how to work with data. I'm not going to lie. That that I mean, that, that was a priority for us in the L&D team, and I think it'll be for years to come because we've seen how it works. But for me, that's key. You need someone. That could also just be someone in your team if you have the time that you want to invest in that to get that someone educated um, because it's not really super difficult to learn how Alteryx works or Power BI or any uh, Tableau or any other of these data crunching tools. Mm -hmm. It's not super complicated. Someone can get upskilled if they've got a little bit of uh, digital acumen and they know a little bit of, you know, they've, they've got skills. That's not impossible. It might be an upskilling opportunity for someone in your L&D team already. Mm -hmm. Now, the stakeholders that you need is obviously, depending on how your structure is and organized within your company, maybe you've got a part of the IT department that's responsible for HR systems and your learning system. You definitely need them to be invested in helping you, especially getting the data out. Um, you could do that with the vendor directly, but it's really good to get someone from the inside because it's probably also the same people sitting on your HR people data um, and how you get that extracted in the right way, um, anonymized, and all that process around that is also really neat to get them involved. So IT, super important. And once, you, once you've got, you know, that's all you need for this, but you need to go into the business and liaise with people who uh, is storing the data from the sales, from the production, from the safety, all sorts of stuff. So you really need to go out and network and, and make friends with a lot of people in the business who works with data. And that's a networking thing. So how you do that, you can start searching for people on Teams or SharePoint with anyone with data in the title, start mapping out your organization saying, okay, we need someone from there, we need someone who can give us that, and then start you know, spreading the news. We are looking for the data so that we can do this magnificent thing. You'll, you'll, you'll begin to build your network, you'll begin to get you know, data in, so you can start ticking your foundational box, the checklist saying, now we've got people data, now we've got business data, now we have this data, now we, and this is coming in. Now we can start. It takes time. And that's also something you need a little bit of patience. But that's, that I think is, is the key thing to do. And once you have the foundation in place, you go to the people in the business units working with training or learning or the ones that you usually uh, work with. Some, it could be someone, let's say, in your quality division saying, guys, now we can actually you know, tell you whether your safety training or your quality training is improving quality or safety. Here's the metrics that we already have. Do you see any holes in that? Do we need anything else? What is it that you really like to change? What do you really want to achieve? And then we go back and say, well, we can actually see that correlation with the data that we have. Let's start here. This is the training we have on the shelves. These, they don't mean anything. They don't really do anything in our historical data. These really do. Or we've got a new design that we want to test out. And then we start that conversation with the stakeholders. Much, much, much better um, and cooler conversation to have because it has a purpose with impact. Now you're actually changing something in learning and development. Before, it was just a gut feeling. You've made this wonderful program we pushed it out there and people were super happy about it but at the end of the day did that change anything for the business that you work for did it really materialize for those people who went on your program did they change behavior did they get better salaries did they get better lives better well-being did they you know provide extra turnover for the company what really happened and that's so refreshing and actually really, really satisfying for any learning and development professional, in my opinion, that you can say that I contributed with the stuff that I can do to get people, you know, learning stuff that changed things in the business. That's, that's what I'm chasing. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, so I wanted to paint a picture. I mean, I have a scenario in mind and I'm, I'm sure that 
the first time or one of the times when you explained learning analytics and you know, showed a dashboard of data uh, to one of maybe your, let's say, senior leadership or you know someone in the team, there must be an aha moment where multiple people would have been, oh, can I actually do that? I mean, it's just something that I can see. Was there a scenario like that, you know, happened in your life so far? And, you know, yeah, I mean, just, just paint a picture for that. Simple as that. No, I've just, you know, I've just been, um, I'm a little bit of an, an annoying type of guy. Uh, I have to admit that um, I am because I keep ask, asking questions. Mm. And I, I just, I can't look myself in the mirror unless I've chased this rabbit all the way down the rabbit hole. If I can't answer, if I've really made a difference, what does it all matter? I can go home and be happy about what I did, which is fine. I can pat myself on the shoulder. I can get some praise from the stakeholders. Around. Yeah, you delivered something really, really cool. But did it really change anything? Hmm. And I can't help asking myself that, you know, and if I worked in marketing or if I worked in sales or if I worked in production, I could go home saying, I actually produced X amount of units today, which helped the patients. I actually helped selling, you know, so many products with, you know, which helped the company, but also helped the patients and helped people, you know, with um, diabetes or whatever it is, right? There's a direct impact of what I go to work for every day with, you know, my strengths and weaknesses. I go to work, I do my, my effort, and then at the end of the day, and that is really direct in, in some functions. And for some reason, it, it's not direct in learning development. And, and I can't live with that. That's where I'm just super annoying. That's, it's just, I, it's a personal thing. Mm. I, I keep questioning these things. And, and I'm, yeah, it, it might be just a, you know, a crusade of mine, but I'm talking to a lot of people all the time who'd also want to, to join the crusade. So, yeah, I think we're, we're onto something here. And I think we can change that. Amazing. And, and I'm sure there would be a lot more people joining this crusade. And it is... Uh... I mean, see, data is what is ruling the world now. I mean, you understand it, you analyze it, you're the king, simple as that. And for L&D particularly, I'm sure that that is just around the corner where there's a data boom particularly, right? <laughs> that everybody wants to get into a deeper into the data because, I mean, look at it. I mean, there's so many different e-learning tools, so many L&D platforms out there. And I mean, we ourselves as a digital adoption platform, we cater to the L&D folks. I mean, it's, it's just so wide, right? And where there is, an, there is a, what do you say, you serve the end user and actually help them understand what the end user is behaving like. Now, there's a huge demand, the huge, uh, what is it, leverage that you get uh, when you actually implement something like that. And, you know, you can keep tweaking things, right? In fact, one interesting thing, so let's say, um, as I mentioned, for us, it's a, we are a digital adoption platform and we have a drill down analytics. And one of the most important thing and, or most interesting thing for me is, we also tell what doesn't work, right? We have a search bar. It's a very small, minute um, feature in that we have a search bar and people search for things. And sometimes they find relevant walkthroughs or articles or anything that, that actually helps them on the, you know, learning in the flow of work. But sometimes they don't find anything. And that's data that goes to the back end, which mm -hmm. actually gives you an idea that, okay, this is something people are looking for, but you didn't really know that, right? And yeah. If you don't have something like that, I mean, it's, it's as simple as that. That data can make a huge difference. It might save a lot of time and a lot of effort for a lot of people. Yeah, I agree with this. Those data points are, are right there, and you can just collect them. What I would challenge is, and this is interesting, is what I found out, and this is probably level, level, level extra, but once you got that data, is that requires people that actually goes into the, the platform, mm -hmm. right? Those are the, they, actually, they have to go in there and they actually have to search but there's a lot of missing information in the equation about what about the people who never get to the search? They just drop out. What about the people who never go to the learning platform? They just drop Absolutely. out. Mm. What about, you know, because because I think learning platforms and, and the engagement that you see in there is probably people who would engage with a lot of things because they're right out there. The, the 10, 15% in your company who's already really engaged would probably engage anyway. And that, that, that kind of becomes your data foundation because their behavior will dominate. What I think is super underrated and I have to go really old school here, is asking people about their behavior. Saying, Gokul, what's the three things the last month or week that you've been trying to do 
but you just couldn't find, or there was a really, what do you remember any feeling about, you know, what was really, you know, upsetting, what was annoying, or what's, who's the colleague that you cannot live without? Who's the, what's the, who's the people in the office that you really can't, you know, if they left, you would be screwed. I mean, and, and, and how does that, how's that all connected? Some of that data, uh, and also what skills do you want to develop in your role? What do you think is the future for the role that you're in? So questions like that and input like that from users, like real qualitative research is super, super valuable to uh, prove or disprove your hypothesis of how the data is structured. Because you can't just trust the data. You do need to validate <laughs> or the, the opposite to a large extent. And I think one of the things we keep forgetting is, why don't we just ask people? They're mm -hmm. right there. Absolutely. And curiosity, right? I mean, ultimately, it's just bound to that. I mean, more curious you are, more faster you learn, more things you learn. It's, it's, it's all that, right? And, you know, I, I know you covered a bit of this, but this question is something I wanted to structure better, right? Somebody who would want to join the crusade of learning analytics. I mean, I'm taking the word crusade because you particularly mentioned that. And it fits. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it, it actually fits, right? I mean, it is it is something where you're actually making a point. You're, you're, it's a journey, ultimately, right? So, so somebody who wants to pick up learning analytics, what kind of skill sets should they have? Or what kind of skill sets do, should they acquire to get to that kind of uh, position to learn more about it? About it? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. And, and there are multiple ways of acquiring those skills. Uh, one of them is just to throw yourself out there and connect with people who's already doing it. So, but it depends on what your role is, in my opinion, because you can strategize around it. You can get that big picture thinking going on about, you know, how do you want to treat learning analytics in the context of the, you know, the content and design, the system architecture and what you're doing, the whole strategic bit. But there's also the hands-on thing that I think is super underrated. You need skills in collecting data. So you, you obviously, if you're starting all over, need some data proficiency. You need to know what data analytics is and what it isn't. And you need to know how to handle that in the systems that you're choosing, because there are multiple tools to choose from. We use Alteryx to pull in the data and structure it and get it through the thought funnels and you know, clean up the data and all that sorts of stuff. And then we send it into Power BI, into dashboards, where we are interpreting the data for people, visualizing uh, trends and, and all sorts of things and in, in connections. So those tools you obviously need to be able to master. Now, this really depends on, because L&D teams could be super small, they're usually super small, and then you've got, you know, bigger teams. But it's probably few of these people, as I see it, it's, I may be completely wrong, but who would be able to and really interested in taking on this digital, it's super digital, right? This journey around structuring data and looking into systems and, and all sorts of things. It kind of requires an interest and curiosity to, to handle that and a little bit of patience because it, it doesn't come super easy. But yeah, you, I, I, my, my recommendation would be link up with people who is already doing it uh, and especially those who are hands-on. Ask them, what tools are you using? What's your structure? What's your foundation? What's your data model? And then start understanding all those concepts that you need in place. And just do it. Yep. And it, it comes out of the necessity, right? I mean, if I'm just thinking out loud uh, for businesses, let's say for marketing, there's marketing operations, who's the hub of data. There are sales operations. Again, sales ops takes care of all the data, the CRM data particularly, which is the entire business data. For um, let's say if you're looking at a customer success, customer uh, experience, they also have an operations team. I mean, when I think about it, learning doesn't have an operations team, right? And that's where the entire control should be. You know, where do we actually need to position the learning, and which which department needs uh, much more fine-tuned or better learning styles or delivery mechanisms? Yeah, I mean, that's something to think about. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity for a lot of people. Or companies, a lot of companies, to structure that in their people analytics team to include learning and, and you know analytics in that because all the other people data is so relevant in the same context. So adding someone to that team servicing the learning team, but someone dedicated to that, you know, learning data um, could be interesting. I think that's an opportunity. Um, also, it'll keep the silos away. Um, I think we see that quite a lot that, that different teams hire their own data analysts and they're in that space kind of defending, protecting their space. No, this data, you can't really. And 
So I, I think connecting or collecting the people as, as many as you can, the same analytics team around people data is useful. I think that's an underrated opportunity. It doesn't have to lie with the learning team um, directly, if you ask me. One of the other things I want to highlight is I think today a lot of L&D teams are relying on their vendors for data. And that's fine. So you're getting data from the interactions that your people are having with the vendor platform or the vendor content, which is all fine and dandy, but it doesn't tell you anything around how the content is performing in your company. And that's the problem. And that's where I would ask you guys and other vendors, when you partner up with companies and L&D teams, you have an opportunity to educate and to bring more value from your product in the company by having this exact conversation saying, it's not enough with our data, the completion data, it's not enough. You guys need to go back and find the people data, the performance data from the business, all that data that actually does tell something about performance in your organization. And then we can pair that up together in a partnership. So I'm, I'm missing that conversation a lot with vendors that I talk to. It's, it's usually, we can bring this data off on how people are behaving on the platform which is great, but staying alone, it doesn't tell you anything about how good the content is actually doing in our company or what value it brings. That's where the conversation stops because you guys in the vendor space can't just get a hold of our internal data, obviously. So we shouldn't be afraid to have that conversation and challenge each other to partner up the data and make sure that we bring value. And you are also interested in that in the vendor space. Everyone I talk to in the vendor space, like we want to do great things with our content in your company. Yeah. Um, but if we can't prove it, then it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, uh, just just related to that that particular point itself, I think this will be the last question. After that, I'll just jump into the, you know, we have a rapid fire session after that, right? <laughs> right. So the ROI, the most important aspect, right? I mean, uh, you just spoke about that in the vendor perspective. Now, Often thousands of dollars are spent for employee training, retraining, refresher training. I mean, you call it. There's so many different ways you deliver it, right? And this happens a lot of a lot of time. And larger the organization, more the money, right? And you need to find the ROI, right? And the ROI is not something that from a business or from a, let's say the people who are creating the content. Initially, also we spoke about that people who are creating the content is not looking at the ROI, but they should be, right? Ultimately, they should be looking at it. So. Let's say, as a person responsible for ensuring this, I mean, I'm telling this way because you are doing the learning analytics and you're ensuring that ROI is something that people can understand, people can see or visualize, right? So what should our listeners do to evaluate the ROI of a L&D employee training, digital adoption, you know, any of the investments that they do, right? How does it all tie That's together? Such a, <laughs> such a good question. Thank you for, for raising that. Yes, and I've been challenged uh, sometimes um, on social media by calling it ROI because there apparently are some technical stuff around. It's not really ROI, but it's something called some. I don't really care about that discussion. I'm not a smart person, so I'll leave that there. But what I can see is we need, because we've got access to the people data again, so we know the salaries, right? Obviously still super anonymized and all that, but we know if we distribute a training that lasts two hours for this group of people, we know how much that will cost us in just bare salaries. That's the cost. Then there's the opportunity cost around what could people have done instead of going on that training. That's something that's a little bit harder to calculate. But if you link up with your finance people, they will probably suggest some kind of way that you can guesstimate to some extent how much are you taking away from the business by actually putting these people on a training instead of doing their normal, normal jobs. That's easy in a sales department probably a lot more difficult in other departments, but that is what it is, right? You can do that in some instances. So you've got the direct costs and you've got the opportunity costs um, around what you're trying to do. And when you distribute, you need to calculate how you're supposed to get that back. Otherwise, you need to accept that the investment is not lost, but that it is a cost for you. So I would argue any anytime you are thinking about deploying a training or learning activity for people, a program, whatever it is, go into those calculations early and say, this is the target group, 
we've got 1500 managers or 1000 managers or 500 managers or 600 employees that needs to go on this course. What's the average uh, salary that we can calculate across currencies, normalized and all that sort of stuff? Yes, we can get a number. This is what it would cost to take them out of their daily jobs in the stuff that we're expecting them to do. Now, what's going to change in the business on the other side of people been through this program? Something is going to change. How does that affect our sales? How do we get the money back? What's the ideas that we can get to increase something or well-being or whatever it is that we then call it investment in well-being? It won't, we won't get it back you know, in, in money or uh, monetary terms, but we will get it back in satisfaction that will then derive into some other value that we can, we can define. But we need to have that conversation every time we deploy something. I, 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 I can't, I could not expect, I could not expect any, you know, any other division or department, product, sales, marketing. You would not do these things without calculating what's the cost of doing it. How do we expect to get that back? Because we are a business, but we're not doing it in learning development to a great extent, at least. Yeah, and we think we should do the more. Yep, and you just dive in pretty much, right? That, that's pretty important. much. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Peter. I mean, that has been. I mean, that that was actually well explained. In fact, if anybody who would want to actually take up learning analytics, I think they should just listen to this podcast over and over again till they get that clarity. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Right. I hope they're not more confused than when we started out, but uh, yeah, I mean, they're well, you know. Then they should just reach out to you, simple as that. Yes. <laughs> Talk to more people. You're very welcome. Awesome. So um, we, we come to the last part of the podcast and it's a uh, rapid fire questions. You know, I, I want to just, I want you to just speak out what comes on your mind. The first thing that comes on your mind pretty much. All right. So yeah. So, so the first one, so if not for L and D or learning analytics, what would have been your profession? A professional footballer. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> so what's the, what's the favorite of the team? Oh, the favorite team? All right. I'm an Inter Milan fan. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Big one. Yeah. Back in the Ronaldo days. Yes. I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> so do you still play? <laughs> I'm terrible at football. I'm super terrible at it. And yeah, but you know, the childhood dream that never came, came true. So it, it was learning instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. So then something about, let's say, the books that you read. What are your must-read books that uh, you would want the audience to actually pick up? And One of the books that really struck me lately was a book called The Dawn of Everything. Um, I believe that Sean Graver was part of that. Um, it's an amazing book about how systems and hierarchies and all that corporate stuff, the management models and all that materialized. And is that really good for us? And how did societies back in the day really deal with these things? An amazing book. The other book I'd, I'd kind of um, promote, and also the one that, oh, I've got two more actually. The last one, I'll, the best one I'll keep for last. But there, Gary Hamill is doing, uh, he's got something called the human movement going on right now, which is super interesting. And he's written a book with a couple of other people called The Humanocracy. Mm -hmm. I would op absolutely mm -hmm. um, recommend that one because it talks about busting bureaucracy you know in corporates you can't get anything done because of systems and approvals and committees and boards and and in that whole space is super interesting how we can get around that and empower people really empower people to make good decisions yeah and and have fun and you know improve well-being in the workspace for people so that's that's one other one the, the third one is the best book that i've read for you know a long long time and it's called How People Learn. And it's uh, Nick Shackleton Jones' book around how people learn. Mm -hmm. I think that his language, his way of explaining it, and, and how that whole design thinking process, the 5DI process, makes so much sense compared to how the human brain works and how we actually learn through effective context. I'm buying so much into his, uh, his stuff. I'm paraphrasing him all the time. And I think that book is just remarkable. So uh, if you haven't read it, go and do that. Perfect. We'll, we'll put the links to that in the excerpt so that, you know, people don't have to hunt for it. <laughs> but yeah, amazing. Th thanks, Peter. Right now, um, I have two more questions. The one is knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Stop being so full of yourself. <laughs> well, I was and I probably still am to some extent. But I think I thought back in the day, if I just produce some really, you know, hot content, 
people will just dive in and do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that didn't happen. That just didn't happen. But I kept doing it. I kept fooling myself for a while where I thought, well, I just haven't cracked it completely yet. I'm, I'm doing the right things. I'm doing something super interesting and innovative. But what I forgot was to do my user research and to look at data. And um, I just realized that one day saying, I really need to go back and question, am I really that good at this? I am probably not. Should I listen to how people and should I look at how people be? Yes, I probably should. Would that succeed? Yeah, there's a higher probability of that. So, yeah, I'd probably give myself that advice. Stop being full of yourself and start listening. So you accidentally discovered the magic of data. <laughs> well, by yeah, accident. I don't know. I, I think stopped by enough mirrors to look at myself saying, hmm, should we change this together? Yeah, let's do that. Perfect. Right. And lastly, uh, there's a question that we ask all the guests. Uh, when you think about digital adoption, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Bullshit bingo. I don't know. I mean, but these words that we put digital adoption and I'm not so, yeah, I think it's important. I mean, that people um, work more digitally because it makes sense to, to a lot of processes and a lot of, of things in what we do. And I believe that the human being is slower than we anticipate to adopt these tools and to adopt these ways of working. I think we always overestimate how well we're adopting these things and how much we are. And then I think it's it's really interesting. You got me going there. Now I think it's I'm, I'm going to take that bullshit thing back because I'm actually diving into it. So it's probably not bullshit. It's great. Let's talk about that. So when people adopt things in their private lives, right? You've got an iPhone. Mm-hmm. You've got a, a computer. A lot of people, even older generations like my, myself, can, can handle such things and are getting better and better at that. And we're not really noticing because the, the stuff that we use on there are so addictive or you know so necessary for us now it's become a necessity to use these things that we just do it. When we're talking about digital adoption in the workplace, it's not completely the same game, mm-hmm. which is super interesting. So the tools that we launch are not really something that you'd like to, it's not something that you would like to go and do, it's something that you're pretty much forced to do. So the resistance is greater. It's not it doesn't just come natural or easy. So then we start, we need training for people to do more digital adoption. It's like, I don't think so. I think we need to remove friction. We need to make it meaningful and purposeful for people. We need to get closer to people and what they do. And we need to design things that helps people with people in design thinking processes and not just make a tool that we think would improve things for people and then launch it to them and just expect them to adopt it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you really got me going there. I'm not sure I hit the nail, but but those are some of the things that I see. I, I think we need another podcast to dial into that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. But it, it's an interesting topic, right? Isn't it? Um, despite everything. <laughs> awesome. Yep. That, that's it. I think no more questions from my end. So... Peter, so we have come to the end of the episode um, of Digital Adoption show, <laughs> right? And I really enjoyed the conversation personally, and I have a lot of lot more questions, honestly. But I think, yes, as, as I mentioned, it could be another podcast itself in a, in a way. <laughs> right, so let's, let's talk again sometime for sure, right? Yeah, I'd be happy to come back. It's been, been fun on my side as well. Yes, absolutely. So, Peter, before we close, it would be great if you could tell uh, the people how can they find you, where can they reach you, and yeah, ultimately, what all or where all can they learn more about learning analytics? Yeah. Well, uh, no worries. I think, well, you can always find me on LinkedIn. You're always welcome to reach out. And, uh, and say hi, and we can have a conversation. I'd love that. So I'm always looking out to you know get smarter, and I get smarter in every conversation I have with everyone, no matter where they are. So, so I really appreciate those things. If you really want to get smarter on learning analytics, as go follow a podcast where David Green does on people analytics. I think he's a smart he's a smart guy, and they do smart things and talk to smart people. And, and then look up a guy called Derek Mitchell from Scotland. He is the learning analytics dude that that. I look to every time. Mm-hmm. He does amazing things. You've got someone like Will Thalheimer who is doing great things, learning analytics. Guy Wallace, also a guy that you'd, you'd want to follow on LinkedIn. See some of the performance metrics that he's doing. He's been doing for years and decades. It's quite amazing to dig into. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of good people out there within learning analytics that you can link up with and, and get smarter uh, with. Amazing, amazing. All right, so it's been a pleasure hosting you, Peter. Thanks a lot for making the time. And yeah, this has been fantastic. And any parting notes? 
No, I'm happy happy to have this conversation with you. I, I love that you guys are interested in learning analytics. I, I feel fortunate to be able to talk talk about it. And I just encourage everyone out there to, you know, to just jump jump into it and not be too afraid of resources or how, how hard it can be and stuff like that. It's not super hard. So link up with people who's done it and then get going. That's my, my best advice for you guys. Perfect. Right. So thanks to everyone listening to this podcast. Stay tuned to the Digital Adoption Show for more great content and some really incredible speakers. Right. Have a great one. 